and that should sort of catch us up with where we are in the textbook, at least based on my recollection of it. Um, keep in mind that I, I don't think it would do anyone good if I just followed the book page by page. That would be boring for you, that would be boring for me, that would be boring for the people that are recording it, all right? Um, no one would win if I did that. So what I like to do is I like to cover things and give sort of my own slant to them, give my own perspective to some of the things, and maybe cover things in a slightly different order and give my own input on it. And the idea is, is that the book and my lectures taken together are better than either would be by themselves. All right. So for example, when we get to text formatting, I jokingly said that that's kind of a boring chapter. Well, maybe I wasn't joking completely, all right? Uh, I'm going to hit the highlights of it, and I'm going to talk about it, but I think you could just as well, once you have the notion of tags down, you can just as well read that on your own and bring any questions you have to class. Or some of these other things, I think, uh, warrant uh, a more detailed uh, description. Now, I've talked before, uh, about how web design is, is really has the technical aspect of it and the design aspect of it. And the design aspect of it, the idea and the notion that I'm putting forth, and I will continue to throughout the class, does not simply mean making it look nice. The design is all about the functionality of it and how easy it is for people to use, how easy is it for people to, at a glance, understand the way your page is and site is structured and organized? That is, that is really the, the guts of design. Now, to be sure, some of the things such as um, color, fonts, come into play. All right? We definitely want our pages and our sites to look attractive and, and have a good color combination. All right? We want our pages and sites to fit a mood, if you will, to express something visually um, about the content. But we also want to use things like colors and fonts and all that to make the message of our site more clear, to use it to organize stuff on the page and so on. Now, the one thing I hear from a lot of students, usually hear it a few times per semester, is when they talk about web design, they will say something on the order of, I'm not very artistic, I can't do this stuff, I struggle with this stuff, whatever. And I can appreciate that. Everyone brings a different set of skills to the plate here. The idea here is we're not creating art. All right. So if you're not artistic, that's okay. All right. And the good thing is, is you only need to be good enough to learn how you can use these things, such as color, etc., to effectively communicate your message. So it's not like you're going to create beautiful websites that are going to be hung in museums. All right. It's that you're going to create websites where the look of the website and the structure of the website and the color schemes and fonts and so on are used to effectively communicate something. So it's design versus art. And that is a skill that you can teach. You know, we could debate all day whether you can teach someone to be an artist or not. You certainly can teach people to sharpen whatever skills they do have. All right? But with things such as design, that's something that is definitely teachable. Now, to be sure, just like with any skill, there will be some people that are better at it than others. All right? But as a web designer, you sort of need both parts to be effective. You need to be able to handle the technical stuff, and you need to be able to need to handle on some level the design stuff. All right? And when we start talking about CSS, that's when we're sort of getting uh, a little more deeper in the design aspect. You know, from the first day of class, when I structured that web page and sketched it out, we were designing it. We didn't have a lot of tools to create our, our design, though. We just had some simple HTML tags. Now with CSS, there's some things that we can put into the visual language of the page to help communicate our ideas. And one of the things is color schemes. How do we know what sets of colors go well together? 
And fortunately, there is science involved in this. This isn't strictly a matter of personal preference. All right. So if you don't have a real good eye for like what colors match up good, there's science to it. And you can refer to a color chart um, to find sets of colors that go together. And I mean, these have been around forever. All right. Online, they're pretty slick and there's a lot of nice features. But in the old days, I don't know if any of you took like art classes or painting classes, they would have color wheels where you could turn and you could see like complementary colors and so on and so forth. All right. So what we're going to do first today is look at generating color schemes. So Here is a page that contains a color scheme generator. One of the ironies of this page is that the text on it is very hard to read. All right, so I'll point out the highlights of it, pardon the pun, and if you look it up on your screen, you can see it. All I did, and this is just one of a number of tools, this is the one that I tend to use a lot. But if you go in and you Google HTML color scheme generator, you'll see a whole bunch of sources. So color scheme designer actually is on just a different link to that same page. All right. Adobe's color wheel. and so on. It doesn't matter which one you use. If the, you know, more than likely, the science behind all of them is the same. So, I'm going to start out and I'm going to pick sort of the general tone of the color that I want the site to be. All right. Now, again, in this example, you know, we're, we're going back to the pizza example. Um, let's just pick. And let's just say for no good reason that we want it to be want it to be green. All right. Now, there's choices, and the choices are listed up here. One of the choices is monochromatic. In other words, all the colors that the color generator is going to pick are shades of the same color. So all of these are shades of green. This is called adjacent colors, whereas on the color wheel, they appear close to each other. So they appear at these different spots. And you notice that you don't get all shades of green here. You get few shades of green, sort of a bluish green, and sort of a yellowish green. I hit this, which is a triad, three colors. That's these positions on the color wheel. And finally, I pick a tetrad, which is four colors, and I get these four colors on the color wheel. I'm going to go back and I'm going to keep it simple and I'm going to pick monochromatic. All right. Um, what I can do then is I can by hovering over these, I can see what the hex code is for these colors. All right. So, for example, let's say I wanted to make the page this color. All right. That is ABDD93. So, I'll go into my HTML code. of the pizza example from last time. And I'll go in. What do you suppose I will use for the selector if I want to make the entire page be this color? Body. Right. Body indicates everything in the body tag. So I will say body. 
and I will say background and try to remember what that was a B D D nine three Go and save this and bring up the page and we'll see that the body of the page is that color. Now in this example, I'm just sort of arbitrarily picking the colors. I pick green for no good reason. Maybe because it's summertime or because, you know, or spring, late spring, early summer, whatever. But you can use colors to sort of evoke a mood. Does anyone listen to heavy metal music in here? Name a heavy metal band. Metalocalypse. Pardon me? Metalocalypse. Metalocalypse. I learned so much from teaching this class. Here's a pop quiz. Let's go and Google metalock. I can't even say that. Metal. Metalocalypse. What color do you think their website's going to be? I think they're going to be black. Amazing. You people are psychic. How do you spell that? Metal. Acalypse. Let's go to the official site. Oh, looky there. It's black or very dark gray. How did we know that? Well, because it's a color that sort of fits the scheme of the, the, the I, I hesitate to use the word message, but it, 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 you know that they want to evoke that feel. What would it be like if you were a heavy metal band and, and the site was, was a bright pink and lovely pastel colors? You're probably never going to see that, right? By the same token, what if you went to a site for Barbie, all right, and it was a black site with, it would be like, what? You know, it wouldn't make sense. So, in that way, the color can sort of reinforce the brand. I hate to use that word that way. It's a marketing term, and I hate to use it because I think it's kind of a dumb term, but it, I suppose it is relevant in this case. Branding, you know. The colors are used to sort of brand, to give, a, give an idea of the brand is. Now, in this particular case, I'm just picking green because I like green, all right? But if there was a particular rationale for this restaurant, you know, maybe you would, uh, or this page, maybe you would brand it to be that color, all right? Okay, so I made the body that color. One thing that we're going to do is we're going to try to avoid overkill. All right? In other words, we have, looks like four different colors here, maybe five different colors here. Yeah, just set up in different arrangements. That's the same color as that, and so on. They're just sort of showing you how it looks next to each other and, and all that. Five colors, is that enough? Well, you want to be careful if you get more than that, right? Because at a certain point, with too many colors, the color sort of loses its meaning, right? And the color becomes sort of more of a distraction than enhancing the user's experience. You know, the example, I think I give the, gave this example before. If you can imagine if you had a page and all the text on the page looked a certain way, but there was a block of text that was in red, that would stand out. You'd look and you'd say, there's something special about that. And it wouldn't matter even if you didn't understand the language. Even if it was in a language you didn't understand, you'd be able to point to that paragraph and say, there's something special about those words, you know. And again, in our society, red sort of has the connotation of a warning or something important or critical. So you'd know that even if you didn't understand the words. That's what I mean by visual language. If the font was bigger, 
that's an example of visual, visual language. The font was in italics. All these things are ways that you can cue the user that there's something special about a piece of text. And they know that even before they read the words. All right? Now, we have five colors here. What if we started using six, seven, eight, nine, ten colors? Then the color would lose its meaning. All right? If stuff on the page was all different colors, then the user would not be able to make an association with, well, this color means something a little bit different or whatever. It's not even so much that people consciously make that. All right? It's something that is sort of, you know, in our culture, just baked in. You know, if you see a newspaper and there are two headlines on the front of the newspaper and one is bigger and one is smaller, you assume that the bigger one is more important than the smaller one. All right? Without even reading it and without even thinking like, hmm, I'm going to analyze this paper and see what the most important story is. Automatically, you're going to know that. All right? It's sort of ingrained in us. If we use too many colors, too many fonts, too many different visual elements, then you simply confuse the user. It's overkill. It's like, I don't know if any of you have had like a bad boss in your lifetime, but you might ask your boss, what is the top priority item for me to do today? And the boss may look and say, well, they're all top priority. That's meaningless, right? Everything can't be a top priority. If everything's a top priority, that means nothing's a top priority. Everything's equal. So if we're using color to indicate things like priority, importance, emphasis, if we use too many colors, it's overkill, and we're simply going to confuse the user. So five colors probably isn't that bad, isn't that small of a number of colors, especially when you consider that we can always add white and black, all right, you get those for free, so to speak. All right, and you can use shades of gray, of which there are actually 255 shades of gray, actually 254 shades of gray. All right, because FF or, or 01 through FE in hex, there are 254 values. So if you hear anyone talk about 50 shades of gray, Tell them, no, there are 254 shades of gray. And send them to me, and I'll explain it to them. All right. OK. So let's go in, and let's go and style this some more. Now that we have our, our color thing, we can style this some more. And what I could do is I could do things like, maybe I will make the text on the page this color. So I will say, background relates to the background color. The color of the text is simply color. And then I can put the hex code. This is what I mean about these codes working whether you understand them or not, right? We went over what these mean. If you understood that, you can sort of tell that this is a brighter color, a lighter color than this, because the numbers are higher, all right? AB is higher than 1A. DD is higher than AZ or uh, 4A. 93 is higher than 00. So you could tell at a glance that this is a lighter color than this. You could also tell at a glance that these colors are predominantly green because the green, the two characters for green are a higher value than the two characters for everything else, for red and blue. But the good news here is, is even if you dozed off during that part of the lecture and didn't follow it at all, it still works, even if you don't understand it. So you can simply copy and paste those values in and you'll have that working. Oops. All 
Now in this case, that dark green on the light green background probably is not, you're probably not able to distinguish that from black font. But looking at it here, it actually is different. Let me change it temporarily to, say, this color. I don't know why they don't allow you to copy and paste. 7A, B8, 5C. Now we do this and it should be noticeable. Yeah, there we can tell it's a different color. All right. Now, one thing that can be useful in testing these color schemes out is to simulate how a colorblind person is going to see these. All right? Because we want to choose a color scheme that works for everyone. All right? Even people that have colorblindness. Now, I use the word colorblindness actually incorrectly because there's not one condition that is colorblind. It's not like colorblind people see in black and white. All right. There's different kinds of colorblindness. You have rods and cones and all kinds of different stuff going on in your eye. All right. I don't know, this isn't a biology class. You got this kind of stuff in your eye. And depending on what's working and what isn't working, you can see different colors or not see different colors. So there's different kinds of colorblindness. And this page has uh, down here in the corner has a vision simulation where I can go in and say let me see if a person has protonopia which affects 1% of men and there's a description a complete absence of red retinal photoreceptors and then there's in gory detail a description of what that is. That is how the colors are going to look to someone who has that condition. The, the color scheme that I chose. So in other words, the background is going to look like that and the text is going to look like that. All right. Now, it's not looking identical to what we would see, assuming we're not colorblind, but at least we can see, hey, there's enough contrast between those two colors that people will still be able to read the text. All right. Likewise, if, if we simulate a different kind of color blindness, that's what it looks like to people who have this, proto-anomaly. And that doesn't look too much different than... Well, I guess it looks a little different, but that looks very similar to what we had. Here is full ac acromatopsia. That's where people would literally see things in black and white. So that's the grayscale that they would see. And then we're back here to the way that people that don't have any form of color blindness would see it. So we can test and we can make sure, hey, even though I choose a color palette and there's certainly nothing we can do to make our page look identical for people that are color blind. They have that condition. There's nothing we can do to fix that through our coding. But at the very least, we can make sure that it works for those people, that there's an adequate amount of contrast between the dark and the bright and so on. All right. Now, let's say I want to make my navigation section this color. 7A, B8, 5C.
Now, guess what? If I'm not mistaken, this isn't going to work. All right? We'll see why it's not going to work in a minute. Let me, let me verify that it doesn't work first. And then we'll discuss why it didn't work. All right? I lied. It did work. And in fact, it works the same in Internet Explorer and Chrome. And it works the same in Firefox. I was mistaken about what version of Internet Explorer that we had here in this room. We must have a later version than I thought. We have Internet Explorer 11, so we have a pretty recent version. Some of the machines on campus, and I'm not sure which ones, but I know over in the business building, when you get over there, check and see. Some of them are running as early as Internet Explorer version 8. All right? Now, with earlier versions of Internet Explorer, HTML5 isn't recognized. And therefore, if I try to put style on an HTML5 element, it just doesn't work. The good news is it doesn't blow up. It's not like it, the page won't display. It just won't display exactly the way that I want it to. There's actually a fix for that. And it's talked about in the textbook, and I was going to show it here, but um, we can save this uh, discussion for later. But there is a piece of code called the HTML5 shiv that you can put in your page, and they discuss it in the book. And that makes browsers, Internet Explorer versions 8 and earlier, kind of understand some of the HTML5 tags. Uh, it doesn't make them completely HTML5 compatible, but at the very least, it allows you to put style on HTML5 tags. So. Um, at some point, they'll talk about that in the book, all right? But I did want to mention it now. Now that we are getting into CSS, all right, it's important for us to test our code across several different browsers, all right? Actually, it's most important for us to check our code against several different, even versions of the browser, because uh, um, again, each browser, each version of the browser is a different program that implements the rules of HTML5 and might do it correctly, might do it incorrectly. So in this case, I opened up my page in the three browsers I have on this machine, Internet Explorer 11, Firefox, and Chrome, and it worked in all of them. So, so far, so good. All right? But if I open it up in i.e. 8, I'm liable to find an error, whereas the nav didn't get styled correctly, and I would know that that was something I would have to fix. All right, and how do I fix it? Well, one of the ways you can fix it is by using the HTML5 shiv. There's a similar little snippet of code that's also discussed in the book um, that fixes earlier versions of Firefox. All right. So take a look at those in the book. I won't talk more about those than, um, than, uh, than I have already today. The important thing, though, is to remember that, um, especially now that we get into CSS, testing across several browsers becomes very important. All right. Questions at this point? Yes. Is there any, I mean, 
Yeah, actually there is. Um, I'm going to Google cross browser testing free. So let's enter in a URL. Unfortunately, we can't do it for our page because our page isn't actually up on the, on the web. But we can try it with there I do this one. telling me I could take up to a minute to do this. Maybe I can test my page. We'll go to the import function after this one's done. I do not believe so. So like for example if you had JavaScript or something on the page, I don't I don't believe it would test that. It would strictly show you just the, the visual aspect of it. I'm gonna remember next time to bring a little tape recorder so I can play like the Jeopardy theme song or something like this while we're waiting. Or I always joke like, you know, with the when, when it's, the class is recorded out, it's like a TV show. How I should have like endorsements like, I'm not really sure what the answer is here. Let me have a sip of my Mountain Dew and maybe I'll figure it out. Or maybe I need like a house band over there that could play like a little tune while we're waiting for these things. Or a lot of possibility. Yes, I could. Okay. This is actually taking longer than some of them, but notice what it's doing is it's testing on a number of browsers. And it looks like I can configure that to Yeah, the different operating systems and browsers. Remember even that, notice here they're doing Chrome and Linux as well as Chrome in, um, yeah, in, in Windows, yeah, in Chrome and Windows. So what this is showing us is this is taking us around to different, different pieces of it, but it's showing us, and again, yeah, that page looks about right. That page looks about right. It's kind of flashing pretty quickly, but I think when it's done, we can go back and look at the steps. So to answer your question, yes, there are tools that you can use. Now, a lot of these, you can maybe do a certain number of tests over a period of time. Beyond that, you have to pay for an account, you know, because they got to make their money somewhere, right, you know. So there'll be like services like this that you can use and you can like test it out once you've assured yourself that it's working 
um, the way you like it to, then you can subscribe to it and pay and do as much testing as you want. The import functionality Oh, that's to import something else. I thought it was to import our web pages. All right. So the bottom line is there are better ways to do that. Um, part of it depends on like the size of organization that you're working for and, and their budget. You know, like in um, I did some work um, over the summer several years back at NASA, and they had a whole testing lab where they would have Macs and PCs and running different browsers and different versions of the browser. It was like, you know, it was like heaven for testing. You know, you could go and you could just test on all these other things. I've also worked on places where, you know, sort of lower budget organizations where you call your friends and say, hey, view my web page. Tell me if it works, and if it doesn't work, tell me what browser it's on. So again, a variety of strategies can take depending on how, how, what your resources are uh, for this. But at this point, I guess, I guess the, the biggest lesson is at this point, you should at least pay some attention to that. And, and for our purposes, test it in, if you have a Mac, test it in Safari, test it in Chrome, test it on Firefox. If you have a uh, Windows machine, test it on Internet Explorer, test it on um, Firefox, test it on Chrome. It's important that you do develop, um, how do I want to say, it's important that you do install and test across browsers. Now there's some general things, like for example, Internet Explorer tends to be the odd person out. All right, Chrome and Firefox often behave about the same because they're sort of based off the same root, the same engine. Whereas Internet Explorer, especially the earlier versions, tends to be different. Um, what was I going to say about that? Oh, the question, uh, I, I think you had the question earlier on, like what browser would I, do I use or what browser I use to develop on? Ideally, you would create your page and test it as you're going along. In other words, if I was creating a site, I wouldn't create all 100 pages and only view them in Chrome until I'm ready to go live and then open them up in Internet Explorer because I'm liable to get a bunch of bad surprises. Whereas if I do a little bit of code, if I create a page, for example, test it across browsers, it looks okay, add a second page, test that across browsers, and so on. If I do that incrementally, um, I'm not waiting to the end and catching a million problems. I'm catching problems one at a time, and I can correct them more easily. All right. I'm actually a little disappointed we didn't have IE8 on here, but I guess ultimately that's, that's a good thing. Now, I've just been using colors as my example for CSS, but don't think that that's like the only thing we can do with, with this. We can really control any aspect of our page via the CSS code. So, for example, if we look at this one, if I want to make the H1 a certain size, Our H1s are that big. If I want to make them bigger than that, I can do something like this. and boom, it makes those bigger. Notice this also corrected the issue that we had, if you remember from before, where the H1s that were included in the article were a little bit smaller. That was a browser default. This makes all of them the same by putting in that H1. All right, so 
This gets again back to what I said before. You use the tags that are most appropriate for the job. You don't use a tag that visually looks right. So if it's a top level heading, you use an H1 for it. If that's not the size that you like, you change the size via CSS. You don't say, well, I'm going to use an H2 instead. All right? So use an H1 for a top level heading. If you don't like the way it's sized, use the styling. Let's look at this style rule again because it follows the same format as the other style rules, but it covers a different attribute. H1 again is a selector that specifies what on the page gets that style rule. In this case, top level headings, H1s get this style rule. Enclosed in the braces, sometimes called curly brackets, is the attribute that we want to change, a colon, and the value of the attribute. What do we want to change? I want to change font size. What do I want to change it to? 3M, E-M. That's just another way of saying I want to make it three times bigger than normal. All right, so 3M would be like saying 300%, three times bigger than normal. So if I said something like was 0.5 EM, that would be half as big as normal. Again, all these style rules are the same. Prior to the braces, is the selector that defines what gets the style rule. Inside the braces there are or there is a list of attributes, then a colon, then a value. So we can change that. I can change the font family on the page and again if I put in the body tag, if I change the font family, that will change the font on the entire page. look at this, has a different font. All right. Font family is not a term that I made up. All right. These attributes and values are from a list of predefined terms, so I just can't make up anything. All right. Font family is how you control the family. Ariel, Helvetica, Sans Serif is a list of fonts. Why do I have a list of fonts there? Why don't I just say one font there? Gives a browser options, that's true. Exactly. If, for example, I was on a Mac that didn't have Arial installed, it would then go to the next one on the list, Helvetica. If I was on some kind of old machine that had neither Arial or Helvetica, it would use a generic sans serif font. So this is a list of looking to see which fonts are installed on the machine uh, that are available in the browser. And if it has the first one, that's the one it uses. If it doesn't have it, it uses the second. Now in this case, Arial and Helvetica are kind of clones of each other. Microsoft didn't want to pay whoever made Helvetica, so they created Arial, which looks exactly like Helvetica. I'm not a lawyer, I'm just telling you what they did. <laughs> All right. Sans Serif is the family to which Ariel and Helvetica belong to. There's families associated with fonts. We'll talk about that in a second. So the idea of this is this is a way to make sure that your page looks pretty consistent across different platforms. 
it's going to try to use the Ariel font. If your machine doesn't have that, it's going to try to use the Helvetica font. Helvetica font looks pretty much exactly the same as Ariel. If your machine has none of those two fonts, first of all, congratulations for having a pretty rare machine. But if your machine had neither of those two fonts, it would use your generic sans serif font, which is close to Ariel or Helvetica. What does serif versus sans serif mean? That's kind of your two main font families, serif and sans serif. Pardon me? Yeah, the, 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 the edges of the letters are done a little bit different. Let me open up Word here and let me create a, a little piece of text with a serif font and a sans serif font. just want to show all right let's pick a good serif font times new roman let's make it real big And let's use a sans serif font, Arial. All right. As was mentioned, the edges of the letters look different in serif versus sans serif. There's a little thingy on the end. All right. Thingy, T-H-I-N-G-Y. That's actually called a serif. All right, in typography. That's a serif, that's a serif. Sans serif, uh, sans is French for without, right? So sans serif means without serif. So notice there's no thingies there. See, if I was making these, these would be thingy fonts and no thingy fonts. All right, but someone else got to it first, so there's serif and sans serif. All right, so what's the difference between these two fonts? Who even cares anyhow? What's the difference between them? Well, I mean, other than the way they look. Go ahead. Typically, the sans serif is easier to read, especially with smaller font. All right? So, yes, that's a true statement. Okay. All right, I, I, I wouldn't use the word childish, but I would say this looks very formal, all right? Looks very classic. This looks more maybe modern, all right? Maybe cleaner, simpler, all right? Anyone else have anything to say? Let's look at the Wall Street Journal website. What do you suppose they use? All right, here we go. They actually use both, so that's a trick question. All right. Headlines are done in serif font. Actually, looking at this closely, it looks like serif all around. 
these links are done in sans serif. So they do use a mix of these. All right. If you think about it, Wall Street Journal, the kind of institution it is, it would make sense that they would have a classic looking site. In fact, this looks very closely to their um, print newspaper. All right. And notice that the smaller of these links are in sans serif. And over here, when you get in the smaller font, they get in the sans serif. But they mix them. Now, same thing with fonts. Mixing fonts is like with mixing colors. You know, mixing the fonts a little bit is good. It adds a little bit of visual interest to the page, a little bit of variety. Certain fonts are better at certain sizes than other fonts. Sans serif are typically better at small, smaller text. Uh, serif work well with larger text. All right. But if you have too many fonts in there, it's going to be a mess and it's going to be confusing. All right. What do you suppose Apple's website is done in? Sans serif. Almost guarantee that. Almost guarantee that there won't be a serif in sight on Apple's site. Watch. The watch is here. Store. Mac. iPhone. Haven't seen a serif yet. We can click around here to different pages. interesting thing is, is if you look even on the Apple products themselves, the packaging for the Apple products uses this sort of font and all that. What do you think the rationale is with, with that? Is it, yeah, number one, it's a branding part. All right. You, pardon me, is 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 less formal to be true is more modern and it's very clean looking the whole idea of apple products is they're trying to evoke the image of being simple easy to use products you don't have to be an engineer to figure out how to use them and so on and they carry that message through in everything their packaging and all that now again i'm not arguing what's a superior technology or what's a better laptop or anything like that I'm just trying to indicate what they are trying to do with their typography and all that. The idea is, is that they're doing it in a purposeful way. You know, you could argue about whether they're right. You could argue about is there another way to do it. But they deliberately chose these fonts. Just like the Wall Street Journal deliberately chose those fonts. All right. So... They're going in and they're making choices based on, number one, the functionality of the page, based on the message that they're trying to convey to, uh, on the page about, and the readability of the page about what fonts they should use. They're making a conscious decision about each one of these. Likewise, if you notice here, almost no color on the Apple page. Little bit of color here. Okay, a little bit more color on that page. All right, so I lied. Exactly, exactly. The, the, the text of the site itself uh, is very monochromatic. And again, there's splashes of color in some of the content, some of the images. You're, yeah, you're right. That's what I meant to say. So font is another thing that you can change besides the colors. We'll change a couple more things. And, and my, my, my task today, my idea today is not to cover every single thing about CSS because, I mean, that's like half the course. All right? I'm not going to cover that all today. But I do sort of want to give you a sense of the possibilities. And I encourage you to experiment with this on your own, right? The lab that we have after class, what do you do in labs? You experiment. 
try these things out and see how they work for you. One of the things that we can do is we can put a width on our different elements. So I can say header width 60%. And I can do the same for nav. Oops, I already have a rule for nav. And let me go and make these white. I'm going to give them a different color than the background of the page so we can see the width of it. There we go. I made the width of these things 60% so they don't extend all the way across the page, but only go part way across the page. One other thing that you can do is That's what I want to do. Oh, I can center these things. Now, I'm not going over these in detail. I'm just I'm throwing these out there. The idea that I want to convey is that the first lab assignment that we get, that, that I get, and that I grade, which I hope to have graded like today or tomorrow, all right? My goal, by the way, is like within a week of the due date to have it graded. So it was due, what, this Tuesday. So my goal is to have it graded by next Tuesday, all right? Pretty much everyone's page looks the same, all right? Because we only covered a few things at that point of the class. So everyone was using the same tags, everyone, no one was using CSS for the most part, and so everyone's page looked the same. What I want to show you here is with just a couple of things in CSS, we can make our pages look way better and way more different. So what I did is I put a width on here, and I put this little snippet of code which centers the content. And now if I go and save it, there we go. This page isn't much different than the pages that you guys turned in for week one, right? But with just a little bit of styling, we can make it look a lot better. Yes? Uh huh. Well, what you do, there's, there's, there, there's two kinds of centering. There's centering a block within the page, and there's centering content within a block. So the margin is used to center that block of content within the page. To center the contact within the block, I go in and say for the H1s, text align center. And that will center the content within the block. Like that. 
Now, I don't expect you to have all these memorized. I mean, I'll put this example up there so you can take a look at it and play with it. If you go to pretty cool site, W3Schools, this is a nice sort of introductory site that's a nice, quick, easy reference. And if you click on Learn CSS, there's a whole list of stuff that you can do. It talks about the syntax, the selectors, and here's things like how you can style text, how you can style fonts. And as we go on throughout the course, we'll hit some of these. But for example, if you want to know how to Let's say I wanted to write H2O, you know, water. All right? If I did this, They sell H2O, erase it all on a line. If you know from science class, it should be H, the 2 should be underneath a little bit, and the O should be on the same line. There's actually a tag under text. somewhere in here. The details aren't important. But there's a tag that says, oh, never mind. This isn't done with CSS. This is done with HTML. But I can go and do that. And there you see the two is down below. There's also an SUP for superscript that will put it above. Like, so if you're doing a mathematical formula, A squared plus B squared equals C squared, you can do that. So I sort of, I sort of uh, uh, went off on the wrong, wrong track on that. The point is, is W3Schools um, is a resource for figuring out like tags like this for CSS rules and so on. So you can look things up there. One thing that some of you struggled with in the first lab is what if you want to put a tag in the text of your web page? All right? I had a couple people ask me questions like that. Like they wanted to say something like, and I'll just throw a paragraph in here in my middle of my pizza discussion. In HTML5, the audio tag was introduced. Notice what happens. You don't see anything there. All right. Why? Because the browser sees that and thinks it's a tag. So there are things in HTML called special characters. And or HTML symbols. And you can use that to display anything, any character that you don't want to be taken at face value. So in this case, the special character for this guy is ampersand LT semicolon. For this one, 
ampersand GT semicolon. And again, these are defined. You can look them up if you Google HTML special characters. Copyright symbol is ampersand copy. And now we're back in business. It can display the it can look like it's displaying the audio tag because we use a special character and down there's a little copyright symbol. Alright. So anytime you have something that you want the browser to treat a special way, you can use a special character for. If you want to use, for example, the Euro sign, you know, if you were selling things internationally and you wanted to say this cost, you know, ten dollars or or eight euros, you could find a special character for Euro. If you wanted to do um, copyright, trademark, any of those kinds of things, there are special characters. If you were doing a mathematics page and you used the Greek letters like Sigma and whatever, uh, if you're doing a fraternity and you wanted to say Sigma, Sigma, Sigma or whatever, you could use the special characters to indicate uh, the Greek letters. Questions about that? We're going to look at a site now that is meant to be an inspiration. All right? And the site is called CSS Zen Garden. And we're going to refer to this site a few times throughout the semester. Let me explain to you what CSS Zen Garden is. CSS Zen Garden is a showcase for people to demonstrate just what you can do with CSS code. So what they did is they took one HTML page and they invited people to style it however they wanted to, any different ways. These pages all have the identical HTML. So we're going to go to that site and we're going to look at a, a series of pages know that the HTML code for these pages is identical, every one of them, with one exception, and that is, is that they apply different CSS. So if I go in here and type in CSS Zen Garden, all right, here is a page. A demonstrate you know, and, and let's 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 note some um, landmarks on this page. CSS Zen Garden, the beauty of CSS design, view all designs, a demonstration of what can be accomplished, the road to enlightenment. So what is all this about? So that's some of the content on our page. Let's go click view all designs and we can look at This is identical HTML as the other page was. Beauty of CSS Zen, CSS Zen Garden, a demonstration of what can be accomplished, the road to enlightenment. Same page, same HTML page. It looks radically different though because it was done with CSS. When you first see this page, it might be puzzling. And it's like, how could they possibly do that? How could these be the same HTML page? It is because the HTML page is simply the content. If I were to right mouse and do a view source here, we would see the HTML is very simple. There's sections, there's headers, there's divs. There probably is not any 
HTML in this file that we haven't covered already in this class. All right? A couple of things maybe. The class and the ID we haven't really covered too much. But other than that, The HTML is something that any one of you in this class could have done. The CSS, on the other hand, is extremely involved and complicated. And it allows different designers to take this one basic page and style it in radically different ways. Here's a third example. As we go through these, notice they all have the same content. This is the potential that you have when you have a good separation between your content, which is in your HTML file, and your presentation or your appearance, which is in the CSS file. You have the potential to make these changes. Now, why is that important? It's important for a couple reasons. First of all, Organizations change, and they need maybe the, the, the appearance and maybe the content of the site to change. Organizations rebrand, for example. All right? Maybe there'll be a time when Apple wants to push out the fact that their products are colorful, and they want to add some color to their site. They shouldn't have to revise the whole site. They should be able to do that only with CSS. I'll give you an example of a project I worked on. I worked for a site for a jewel, a jeweler. All right. Now, as you can imagine, what are the big days for jewelry stores? Well, there's Valentine's Day, there's Mother's Day, there is Sweetest Day, there is Christmas, and I don't know, maybe a couple other in there. Well, they wanted to be able to easily make their site look Valentine's-y or make their site look Christmassy, or make their site look Mother's Day-ish, all right, without having to change all the HTML code. So that was done strictly through changing the CSS. So when it got to be Christmas time, we plugged in a CSS file that used Christmas colors, Christmas background images, and so on. When it got to be Valentine's Day, we changed the CSS. So we didn't change anything in the HTML, we just changed the CSS to give the page the look of that holiday. Another example is when you start talking about displaying a website on a mobile device versus on a desktop device. All right? Websites on mobile devices typically are done in a more simple manner. In other words, typically they're one column, not multiple columns. So something like this, which looks great on a big monitor, probably wouldn't look so good if we viewed it on a smaller phone. So with CSS and a little bit of coding, we can make it so that if you're viewing this page on a desktop machine, you see one CSS file. If you view that same page on a mobile device, you use a different CSS file and can do that. I don't know if you can do this in Canvas or not, but you used to be able in Angel to like change your color scheme and make it look a certain way. You might be able to do that in Canvas. I'm not sure. I haven't checked yet. All right. And you know, this that's nice because um, you know, hey, you know, it's better to come to a page that you like to look at than a page you don't like to look at. So you can make the colors fit your mood or whatever. But there's also practical implications to that. If you have, if you're colorblind or if you're visually or otherwise visually impaired, certain color schemes might work better for you. Certain sizes of fonts might work better for you. Certain fonts might work better for you. So allowing users the ability to, to pick what, how their page is styled is a big win. There is a site for people that are blind and, and visually impaired, a school for them. That 
unless they've changed their website. And they have changed their website. Where do you see that? Oh, I, I may. This takes you to different portions of the site depending on 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 the profile of the person visiting this. Visually impaired person. This site used to allow you to configure um, the site um, and the appearance of the site based on your preferences. And again, it's especially relevant for someone that's visually impaired. Um, I, I guess they've changed. Oh, there we go. Customize your view. All right, there we go. So I can change the color combination. Maybe. And of course, I'm in an Internet Explorer. Let's go in Chrome. There we go. As I click around, I can change the color scheme that's used. I can zoom. Speech on. To hear areas of the page read aloud, move your mouse to them and press the space bar key on your keyboard. School. Admissions. Infant toddler program. Preschool. Okay. Let's imagine I'm let's imagine I'm a blind person. How do I put my mouse over something if I'm a blind person? You don't. So how do you navigate the page instead? Via the keyboard. Tabs will take me over. I, I actually I'm I'm digressing a little bit, but I think it's relevant here that um, um, as part of my summer fellowship at NASA, I worked with someone who is visually um, impaired, and their mentor at NASA was visually impaired as well. And um, the mentor told me, if you really want to get the experience, turn off the monitor and unplug the mouse, because that's effectively how someone that can't see interacts with the browser. So I'm not going to go to all that, because I could just imagine me forgetting to plug something back in and the next person that had a class in here would, would be all confused and all that. But the way they would navigate is using a keyboard. So if I landed on this page, I could go, hit the, pound, hit the tab to go to the next thing, then space. Our students see the world differently. We see a world of teachable moments. Ten quirky things that, really, annoy people who are blind. Okay. Now, let's digressing a little bit because this is done with more than just CSS. All right? But still, the basis of this, what makes all this work, is having a good separation between the content of the page, which is in HTML, and the appearance of it, which is in CSS. When you do that, you can allow people to customize their view. Because you're not changing the content. You're simply changing the way that you're presenting that content to the people. All right? So people can make preferences based on their just personal preferences. Hey, I like this color more than other, uh, other color combinations. Or for functional reasons, like I can read this color better than I can read that. All right. Questions. Now, 
If you remember, if you remember, last uh, time we actually made two pages. All right. I made my where am I going to get my pizza from, and I also made a page about pizza chains. And notice this one doesn't have styling, right? This page has styling, but this page doesn't. Well, one of my goals as a web designer is to make my pages consistent. All right? They're not necessarily all going to look exactly the same, right? There might be a special page that I want to have a little bit different coloring or different fonts or whatever. But for the most part, I want pages to be consistent. That's a visual cue to people that, hey, you're still on the same site. You haven't accidentally clicked and ended up on someone else's site. All right? If you notice back before, and I don't think we clicked around too much on the um, Wall Street Journal site, but if we would have done that, or as we clicked around the Apple site, you'll notice that each one of those pages looked real similar. All right? It wasn't like the home page for Apple was monochromatic using sans serif fonts, and then when you went to the iWatch page, it was a rainbow of colors using serif fonts and, and all that. There was a consistent look to it. So making your pages look consistent is a goal. So right now, my two pages don't look consistent. So if I click here, that's the page I get. If I click here, that's the page I get. They don't really look consistent. So, one of the things I can do to make them consistent is I can put the same CSS code in it. So I'm going to go, I'm going to copy the CSS code from this guy. And I'm going to put it in this guy. All right. So, hey, they're starting to look consistent. Now, there's some things I could do with the content to make them look even more consistent, but we'll address that issue later. All right, that's all well and good. What's the problem with the approach I took of cutting and pasting from one page to another? You might have extra stuff you don't need, which... I suppose you could identify that as a problem, but it's probably not that big of a deal. For example, I think what you're saying is I don't really have any ordered lists on that page, so any styling I had for ordered lists would be a waste, but I'm less concerned about that. If I make any CSS changes, I have to do it in both places. Well, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that is that I'm lazy. I have better things to do than make the same change five times, right? The whole reason I became a software developer is so that I wasn't doing the same job over and over and over again, right? Software development is the one job where it pays if you're the right kind of lazy, all right? What's the right kind of lazy? The right kind of lazy is figuring out ways to make your job easier going forward, all right? So, for example, let's say I want, for whatever reason, my H1s to be white text on a black background. I go in here, into my pizza page, and I go and change this to be 
a background of black. Let's say I am the world's first heavy metal pizza parlor. I, I saw one of the most awesome videos this week. It was the heavy metal vegan chef where he does recipes for vegan dishes but he sings them as though they're heavy metal songs. You take the pasta and then you put in the spinach and it, it was it was unbelievable. It was so good. At any rate, so let's say that guy opens a pizza parlor. I'll go here and whoa, I screwed up. Oh, I where how did I screw up? Let's see. I changed the body, yeah, that's not what I wanted to do. It's okay to warn me if I'm going to do something stupid, by the way. All right. There we go. There we go. So, I changed the one page so that the H1s are black with white text. But what happens when I go to this page? Well, they're the other way. So they're inconsistent. So what would I need to do? I would need to go in and make that same change here. All right. Yes, I can cut and paste. I could cut and paste again. And in this case, where I only have two pages, it's not that huge of a deal. Right? I copy and paste from one page to another. All right. What happens when I have, though, 50 pages in my website? Or even more? Well, then that's a lot of cutting and pasting to do. What happens when you have to do an activity over and over again. You get bored with it. You make mistakes. You get tired. You start thinking about when is my lunch break coming up? Where should I go? Gee, all these pages about pizza makes me hungry for pizza. Hmm, who has a special? You start thinking and getting distracted with other things. Plus, it's time that's spent that could be better spent doing other stuff. All right? So you're prone to make mistakes, it's tedious, and you could really be putting your attention to something that's even more important if you don't have to copy and paste. So what do you suppose we're going to do with the CSS? How are we going to make it so that we don't have to go into every one of our pages and copy and paste or manually make the changes on every single page? Can you have a separate CSS file? Yes, you bet you can. And it's a good idea to do that. What does it mean when I say it's a good idea to do something in a web development class? Yeah, we'll do it, yeah. But it makes it easier to change later on. Almost all the things that I'm going to, I, I ever talk about in any of my software development classes where I say it's good practice to do blank. The reason it's a good practice to do blank is it's going to make it easier to change the code later on. It's going to make it easier and it won't take as long. It's kind of like I said at the beginning of this section. It's, a, it's an inspired laziness. 
I'm going to spend a little bit more work now to make my life a lot more easier later on. So what I can do is I can actually take this CSS code, all right, take the CSS code, and I can put it in its own file. Now notice that I don't take the style tags. When I do this technique, I don't need the style tag because it's in its own file. So I take this code and I put it in its own file and then I save it as a file name. And I'm going to do the same thing that I've done with the HTML files. I'll say all files and I'm going to give it a name that's going to end in .css. So I'm going to say style.css. Alright. So now, all my style code's in one place. I simply have to change these two pages to point to the style code. How do I do that? Well, now that I've put it in a separate file, I can get rid of all this. And I can simply say link type equals text slash CSS rel equals style sheet href equals style.css and that's the name of the file that I've used. Alright. And I can put that code in both my web pages. So I can put it in this web page and I can put it in this web page. I have the style in there. I click here. Same style there. Now, let's say it's Valentine's Day coming up and I have my special heart-shaped Valentine's Day pizza going on sale. And I want my page to look more Valentine's Day. -y. I do not have to go back into every page. And it's the same if there were two pages or if there were 200 pages, right? I don't have to go in all 200 of them, just like I don't have to go in all two of them. I can go into this single CSS page and do something like make the background pink, let's say. save it, make that one change here, and that page gets it, this page gets it. Probably want to change that green too because that doesn't look too good, but you get the idea. So that's a big deal. All right, That's a big deal, being able to put this, th this stuff in different files and then simply point all my web pages to the same CSS file. That's a big win for maintainability. So I can change my entire site simply by changing the code in one file. All right? So anything about the page that I can visually control, I can put that in a file change it, and everywhere where I have that element, I'm going to get that. Now, someone made the point before that this has style code for navs, h1s, headers, articles. The chain page doesn't necessarily have all of those things in it. 
It might, but it doesn't necessarily have it. That really isn't a big deal. The fact that there might be something in the style file that is not in one of my web pages. I may, for example, have a coupon web page that doesn't have a footer to it, all right, or doesn't have a header or something like that. That's really not that big a deal. It's not, if, if the HTML page doesn't have it, well, then that style rule doesn't get applied. It's not like there's an error or something. It's simply just that one won't get applied to, to this. Any questions at this point? All right, I want to talk about more next time, what I wanted to talk about originally today, <laughs> which was text formatting. So we'll come back to that on Tuesday. And I want to spend more time talking about putting stuff in other folders. So we briefly talked about that a little bit. But for now, just put everything in a single folder, zip up the folder, and upload it, and you should be okay. Questions? All right, we'll see you in lab.